tinker. Okay. So you guys are used to these slides by now. So module three, we're going to move on to um, expression and differential expression. This is your third out of four modules. And the objectives for this module are um, to talk about estimating expression for known genes and transcripts. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the idea of FPKM versus raw counts. Uh, we're going to review very briefly so the differential expression methods, or a couple of different ones, uh, and talk about downstream interpretation of expression and differential estimates. Um, I think we're going to have a slide or two just talking about multiple testing correction and a few other topics. So we've already actually, just in our minds when we were reviewing the IGB alignments yesterday, started to think about expression estimation for known genes and transcripts. Right? So yesterday when you guys were looking at IG IGV, you could see the alignments that you've made of your raw data against the reference genome and you could line those up against um, known models of genes and from that data you could already start to think about uh, let's say total expression level for uh, one gene versus another or for a tumor versus normal. Uh, just by, remember, comparing the, the coverage estimates for those two genes. Uh, we, I don't think we got into this, but you could probably imagine how you would start to go about thinking about alternative expression as well, right? Because you could see alignments that are spanning certain junctions, and you could make inferences that um, if there's more reads supporting this junction than another junction, maybe that means this particular isoform is more highly expressed than another isoform. So, of course, you can't really do that manually in IGB. It's nice to kind of confirm with your eye, but we need a more comprehensive solution. And that's what Cufflinks is going to give us. I'm just showing here an example of a gene that is perhaps down-regulated, where the coverage is higher in uh, the top sample than the bottom sample. Uh, you can also see that there's evidence of a 3' prime bias in this sample. So as you go um, towards a 3' prime end of this gene, you're getting more coverage, and it kind of drops away uh, towards the 5' prime end. And that's pretty common uh, to see. And I mean, part of the reason is that if you're doing a poly-A selection, you're, you're pulling down fragments from the 3' prime end. And if you have degraded RNA, uh, you're going to have a harder time pulling down those fragments from the 5' prime end. So has anyone heard of FPKM or RPKM? Yeah. So this is probably the most commonly used measure of expression level from RNA-seq data. I think, I mean, the commonly cited first paper for an RNA-seq experiment introduced the concept of RPKM, I believe, or something very similar. So RPKM is basically an acronym for the reads per kilobase of transcript per million mapped reads. And FPKM is almost exactly the same concept, uh, but it's referring to fragments instead of reads. And the main reason that came about is when we switched from single-end sequencing to paired-end sequencing, uh, we started thinking about the fragment that was being sequenced from both ends rather than a single read of a fragment. But they're basically the same concept. It's just a different convention. In RNA-seq, um, the relative proportion or the relative expression of a transcript is proportional to the number of fragments that originate from it. So if you have um, more fragments of RNA in your RNA-seq sample for a particular transcript, you expect to get more random fragments from it, and then therefore because you're randomly sequencing these fragments, you're going to get uh, more sequences and more alignments from that transcript. That's a theory. But there's a couple of important sources of bias. So bigger genes, right, like a huge gene, it just has more space 
So when you randomly break up the, the RNA in your sample, more fragments are going to tend to come from large genes than from small genes because there's just more RNA there to create fragments from. Similarly, the total number of fragments is related to the total library depth. So if I have two samples and I sequence one of them with one lane of alumina and one of them with two lanes of alumina, I'm going to just, by the very nature of it, get twice as many total fragments from the two lane sample as I am from the one lane sample. And you wouldn't want to start comparing just raw counts of fragments from those two samples without first correcting for that difference in library depth, right? That makes sense? And there's always differences. So even if you do you know, one lane for each and you try to make them exactly the same, there will be differences in um, the efficiency of cluster formation, which will result in more fragments for one sample uh, than for another. So you always want to correct for uh, the total library size. So RPCAM and FPCAM have a fairly uh, simple formula, which is that you just take the number of mapped reads or fragments uh, for a gene or transcript or exon or whatever feature you're trying to calculate an expression estimate for, and uh, you divide it by the total number of mappable reads in the library and the number of base pairs in that feature, gene or transcript or exon. And then we do these, um, the K and the M come from basically timesing by a thousand and by a million so that the numbers just work out nicer, basically. If you just divide by the total library size and the, the size of the gene, you end up with all these like weird fractional numbers. So they just decide to make everything relative to some hypothetical thousand base pair gene and million read library. So that's why you're uh, multiplying by a thousand times a million, which is 10 to the 9. Does that kind of make sense? Is, you can calculate this on your own from raw, raw counts, uh, but in Cufflinks, this is done for you. So the main output you get from the software is an FPCAM measurement. So how does Cufflinks work? Um, this is probably the topic for a whole presentation. It's, there's been a, more than one paper published on how Cufflinks works. It's quite a sophisticated piece of software. Um, you probably can't even make out all the details of this figure. So we're just going to think about it in really high level terms. Uh, you can read the paper. There's reasonably good documentation online um, and lots of discussion online about the specifics of how it works. But the general concept is you have, you assemble these bundles of, of fragment alignments. So fragments that uh, kind of overlap are assembled together. And then they're connected in a graph. So they try to basically like draw a path through transcripts that have connections by fragments which overlap. And from that, um, you can infer or attempt to infer transcript isoforms from this concept of the minimum path required to cover the graph. So they will have a graph like this and they try to, using probabilistic methods, say, okay, this is probably a transcript, this is probably a transcript, and this is probably a transcript. And if, depending on the options you use with cufflinks, you will, and if you have known isoforms available, you can use those known isoforms to guide cufflinks so it'll say, okay, I already know about these real transcripts. Um, this part of the graph fits perfectly with this real model of, of reality. Uh, but it can at the same time say, there's this other exon here that isn't explained by any of the known transcripts. And looking at the graph, I predict that there's a fourth novel transcript for this gene. Or you can run cufflinks in a totally de novo mode where it will try to basically infer all of the transcript structure right from your data. And the quality at which it does that will depend on the quality of the data that you have and how good the algorithm is. Uh, from experience, it, it's far from perfect. Like, it does a pretty good job, but sometimes it will definitely make mistakes. So you want to keep in mind that when it's doing this, making inferences about transcripts, it's just doing its, its best guess, essentially. And the, the transcriptome is complicated, and it's a really hard problem, right? So you have cases where there are genes right next to each other that have really uh, complicated exon structures. Uh, 
um, that might be overlapping. Um, they might have a lot of different isoforms that share 95% of the, their exon content and just have these subtle little differences, which sometimes are just basically almost impossible to deconvolute with uh, short fragment data, right? Because we're starting with a, a very imperfect measure. Ideally, what you would do is pull down every transcript in its complete form and sequence it entirely. But that's not what we're doing at all, right? We're pulling down transcripts, we're breaking them into pieces, and then we're only sequencing little pieces of the pieces, and we're trying to reassemble the reality from that. So mistakes do happen, basically all the time. So you'll sometimes see cases where you look at the cufflinks predictions against the alignments in IGV, and you'll see that it's mistakenly added like the exon of this gene as an exon in the gene next to it. Of course, the other problem is that biology is also messy, and sometimes that's real. There really are bi biological read-throughs of one transcript into another, and sometimes that has functional significance, and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it's just a mistake of transcription. So it, it's a very hard problem. No, yeah, it can do it without. So that, that's the de novo mode, exactly. It will, yeah, define your transcriptome for you as best as it can from your data. And you can do that with, um, let's say you have 100 samples. You could do it with as much of your data as possible to try and get a complete picture of all the different transcripts across your uh, population of samples. And then you can use that to um, sort of save a definition of the transcriptome, kind of like your custom annotations, and then go back and estimate expression for those definitions on a sample by sample basis. Yes. Uh, I don't know if there is a performance advantage. There may be. Um, it just, if you, if you have a good definition of transcripts and you provide them, then it gives cufflinks a lot of information to start with, right? And it will probably do a better job of estimating expression for the genes and transcripts that you know about. But where it can't fit a piece into what's known, it will create a new transcript if it feels like there's one there that isn't explained by what's known. R-A-B-T option? I'm not sure. I'd have to t double check. I don't think we run with that mode in this lecture. Um, where were we? The abundance of each isoform, right, is estimated from a probabilistic model. So it looks at, at these definitions and it basically assigns fragments to each definition to come up with a kind of um, count of a likelihood that each fragment belongs to each um, inferred transcript and then assign an expression value to each transcript. And it tries to make use of other information like the fragment length distribution. So depending on the distribution of fragment lengths, um, there's different likelihoods that you would be able to measure certain kinds of events. So it tries to take that into account when it's estimating expression. So yeah, you can read the paper and there's a lot of like math and statistics in it. But if you really want to understand the guts of it, um, it's probably more than we can cover right now. And there's a lot of uh, debate online about whether it's the best method and what other methods are better. Um, you can actually, there's some blogs that the author, some of the authors of Cufflinks have and other people have, and there's been like an ongoing kind of argument online about what you should do for expression and differential expression estimation, including some really like inflammatory conversations and some name calling and stuff. So I think it's it's reasonably good, but I wouldn't it's not like ground truth necessarily. We use combinations of methods because we don't totally believe in cufflinks only. So actually in your 
lab materials, we're going to kind of go through two parallel approaches for estimating gene expression and transcript expression levels. We're going to spend most of the time working on cufflinks because that's kind of the workflow of this lecture or this lab, but you guys have been doing like star alignments on the side. We're also going to do optional HTC counting instead of um, using the top hat approach, the top hat cufflinks approach. And then we're going to use edge R, or there's an example of using edge R instead of using cuff diff. So how does cuff diff work? Uh, basically, cuff diff takes the inputs of cuff links and compares two sets of cuff links uh, outputs to come up with a differential expression estimate. So this takes into account um, the variability and fragment count for each gene across replicates. So if you have replicates, which I highly recommend, each replicate will have its own um, fragment count for each uh, transcript that's been defined, and the variability in those counts will be modeled. Uh, the fragment count for each isoform um, is also estimated in each replicate, so it, does it basically does it at the gene level and at the transcript level. And there's also, when you're looking at the transcript level, there's a measure of uncertainty in the estimate arising from ambiguously mapped reads. So remember that I said um, there's a lot of complexity in the transcriptome, and sometimes two transcripts can be very similar, right? So you could have like chalk. Oh, they took away our chalk. Beside my computer. Oh, boxes. All right, so this is a simple case, but if you have two isoforms of this gene, one that includes this middle exon and one that doesn't, all the reads that map here are sort of ambiguous, right? Like these reads could be counted towards this isoform, or they could be counted towards this isoform. Whereas reads here, or reads that span this junction, will give you unique information about the top isoform. Whereas reads that span this junction would give you unique information about the bottom transcript, right? So when you're estimating the expression for any particular isoform, the amount of non-unique versus unique content uh, matters. And the less unique content there is, the more uncertainty there is in your estimate of the expression for that isoform. So Cufflinks tries to take this into account and assign a kind of um, measure of variability or uh, accuracy for each isoform depending on the quality of the information it has about that isoform. So those variance estimates are then used um, in statistical testing to report significantly differentially expressed genes and transcripts. Um, they use just modifications of the typical kinds of uh, statistics you would use to calculate differential expression. So we're also going to do a step in between cuff links and cuff diff, which is cuff merge. So why is cuff merge necessary? <coughs> Basically, you need cuff merge uh, if you have more than one cufflinks assembly. So remember that even if you're not using the de novo mode, even if you're using the so-called reference guided mode, where you have some concept of the known transcripts, cufflinks still to some degree is going to build transcripts of its own. Like It'll give you estimates for the known transcripts, but then it's going to say, there's this other transcript that I think is here, and I'm going to call it X001, and it's this new custom transcript I've defined just in this cufflinks run. When you run two different samples, that's going to happen both times. And because they have different data in them, they're going to come up with different creations. There's going to be different potentially novel isoforms defined. Now when you go to calculate differential expression, it's not an apples to apples comparison, right? Because you've got some unique isoform defined in sample A and some other unique isoform defined in sample B how do you say what the differential expression is between those? So cuff merge basically takes these two assemblies, 
and overlaps them and tries to come up with one consistent uh, set of <coughs> definitions. So even though this isoform was only observed or predicted in sample A, it's now going to look for that isoform in sample B as well, and vice versa. So it's going to create kind of a union of the, all the different uh, transcript definitions. So cuff merge is basically a necessary step to, to compare more than one cufflinks assembly. <coughs> it also uh, filters out some artifacts. Um, and then optionally, you can provide a reference GTF, again, to uh, merge the novel isoforms and known isoforms. <coughs> and the ultimate goal of the cuff merge is basically to make uh, a new GTF file. So you have your GTF file for your known transcripts. You're going to create a new GTF file that is a kind of superset of the known and novel predicted isoforms from cufflinks so that you can do cuff diff and compare apples to apples, like I said. The last thing that we're going to do with this data is run Cummerbund. So Cummerbund is basically um, a data visualization tool. So after you've run, you've got your alignments, and you've run cufflinks, and you've merged your cufflinks assemblies together, and now you've calculated uh, differentially expressed genes and isoforms. You want to kind of visualize the data, get a sense of the overall quality, how many differentially expressed genes there are, what do they look like. Um, you might want to look at things like MA plots or volcano plots. Uh, you might want to look at um, cluster diagrams or do some principal components analysis. Your sort of typical heat maps, all those sorts of things. Cummerbund is a really quick way to get all these kinds of visualizations um, basically automatically by just pointing it at your cuff diff result. <coughs> and here I've just shown a sampling of a few of the, the graphics that you get. Um, we're going to produce all these uh, in the lab and we're going to go through them. Uh, but you get things like you know, here's your typical heat map showing, uh, let's say, normal versus tumor for a bunch of different genes. This is the kind of thing you see often in a paper. Um, it can produce actually some fairly sophisticated graphics. Like this would take you a long time to figure out how to produce an R to get an ideogram and to get a representation of the transcripts that were predicted from cufflinks and compare those to, let's say, known isoforms from ensemble and then add in other tracks like conservation tracks and so on. So Cummerbund basically provides examples and code to do all that for you um, without you having to figure out how to do it. Of course, as soon as you want to change or modify, then you have to sort of understand what they're doing. And, but they provide a lot of functions and tools um, that make your life kind of easier in R. <clears throat> so there, there are alternatives to FPKM. Uh, the biggest or most obvious alternative would be just raw read counts. Um, so instead of calculating this FPKM, uh, you basically just assign reads or fragments to some defined set of genes or transcripts and determine raw counts. And this is usually done against known definitions of genes and transcripts, although you could use cufflinks to assemble a transcriptome and then assign uh, reads to that um, new GTF and then pull counts out of that. Uh, we're going to use HTC count, which is just one of the various methods you can use to assign counts to genes or transcripts or exons. Um, I'm just showing an example of how you run it. It's reasonably straightforward. Uh, we're going to do this in the lab. Uh, I've put a link here to a Seek Answers form about a sort of important caveat of transcript analysis by HCC count. So the author of this software himself doesn't really think that the transcript level analysis is that reliable. And it's for the reasons that we talked about, that it's just, it's hard to assign 
each fragment, like most fragments, you just can't know which transcript it really should be assigned to. There's only a small number of unique ones. And because of that, um, the estimates that you get for transcripts are less accurate. Uh, so usually when we use um, the count-based approaches for differential expression, we do it at the gene level. <laughs> Yeah, so that's what FPKM is trying to do, right, to account for the size of the library. With the, um, just a raw count-based approach, you, of course, still have to account for the size of the library, but it's done in the differential expression statistic. So you feed in just the raw counts, and it, part of the differential expression statistic, it models the expected distribution of fragments given the total number of fragments and incorporates that directly into the differential expression statistic. So you can't do that much with the raw counts except calculate your differential expression p-values. So they don't mean for you to really think about the individual count numbers. They don't want you to compare the counts from one gene to another or the counts from one gene uh, in one sample to another sample. They're just input into the statistics for calculating differential expression. If you want to start making like the heat maps like we're talking about, then you where you're just going to straight visualize and think about this gene versus that gene or this sample versus that sample, you need to have something that's normalized like with an FPKM so that you're taking into account gene size and library size. If you like in let's say you pulled down a protein and then sequence the protein, then you're not really looking at a full gene in any of these cases. Does it then better use HTC to do, look at raw So if you've done yeah, like some kind of capture or selection that's skewing your um, <coughs> fragments towards some specific subpopulation of the transcriptome. Probably for that, yeah, you want to obviously want to make sure that you keep conditions as similar as possible between your biological comparators. Uh, but then, yeah, I think you could, you might want to use like an edge R HCC count approach. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm not that familiar. I know that cuff diff has slowly improved with regard to more complex experimental designs like time series or multi way comparisons. Actually, I think on the next slide, one of the advantages or reasons to use the count based approaches is because the differential expression packages for the count based methods tend to be they tend to have a lot more options about setting up um, your um, experimental design so they they will have options for time series or for multi-way comparisons you just need to set up the differential expression uh, function correctly it's set up in much the same way like a regular statistical package would be set up like an ANOVA or something like that where you just need to define the test correctly. But it has a lot of options. For what? For a time series type thing? I would probably use raw counts because the software that takes raw counts has better options for that. But it's not to say you couldn't you could take FPKM values and you might just need to pull them into R and define your own statistical method. Like cuff diff might not do what you want it to do for a time series. I've never checked into that though. I mean if you Google cuff diff time series experiment, someone might say, oh yeah, there's this option in cuff diff that I haven't heard of that would allow you to do that. But I, I don't think there is. But, but for sure there are in some of the other packages like edge R or DEGSEQ or DEC that use count based approaches. So I tend to use the FPKM style approach um, A, when I want to leverage the benefits of the Tuxedo Suite, which is that it's reasonably easy to install and run. Um, and 
has a lot of flexibility in terms of whether your uh, transcripts are known or if you want to build novel transcripts. FPCAM is good for visualization, so if you want to make a heat map, it tends to work out better using FPCAM than trying to make sense out of raw counts. Uh, we usually use FPCAM when we're calculating fold changes, again, because it's more of a apples to apples comparison. You can't calculate a fold change very easily directly from raw counts because you haven't taken into account things like the library size or the size of the gene. Uh, but the counts-based approach is arguably, many people have argued that the statistical methods are more robust, so the identification of which genes are differentially expressed might be more accurate from the count-based approach, at least at the gene level, and it does accommodate more sophisticated experimental designs, so things like time series or um, block designs or different kinds of experiments that have more samples or more types of samples. So we're going to look at EDGE-R if we have time. If not, you've been provided with the optional exercises and um, uh, code and so forth to try out EDGE-R. There's a, a whole bunch of others though. There's DEC. Uh, if you search in Biostar or Seek Answers, you'll find all kinds of packages for doing differential expression from RNA-seq data. There was a paper recently that actually looked at the differences between these different approaches. So they compared CuffDiff, the latest version at that time, EDGEAR and DEC, just as three examples. And what they're showing here is the overlap in the genes that were predicted to be differentially expressed for some sample comparison. And you can see there, there certainly is overlap, but there's also a lot of overlap. Like there's 1,600 genes that were found to be significantly differentially expressed by DEC alone, and a smaller number for CUFDIF and EDGEAR. <clears throat> so depending on what you're trying to do, if you're trying to be really comprehensive, like you don't want to miss anything, and you're going to go ahead and validate at another level, like let's say with uh, qPCR or some other experiments, then maybe you want to take uh, the union, like everything that was predicted by any one method. If it's really important that you feel confident in the differential expression, you might want to just look at the intersection, so things that were predicted by more than one method or all three methods. So we typically run both EDGEAR and CUFDIF. Um, maybe we should think about DEC because we could be missing a lot. I think it's really important to remember the lessons we've learned from microarray days. Um, maybe a lot of you are too young to remember some of those days, but um, with RNA-seq, we haven't really gotten to the point where we have tons and tons of samples, right? Like we're still doing RNA-seq on 10 samples or maybe 100 samples because it's pretty expensive. But we're slowly getting to the point where it's similar to microarray days, where you might, you know, compare 500 normals to 500 tumors or something like that. But most of the issues with statistics are the same. And we've kind of forgotten those in some ways because everyone's very excited about trying out RNA-seq, but then they're faced with the reality of the cost. So they'll do things like, there are papers that compare literally one RNA-seq library to another, calculate differential expression, and then make some conclusions about the genes that were differentially expressed in that one versus one sample. And, you know, they justify it because that, at the time, cost them $20,000. But you have no biological replicates, right? Like, what the conclusions you're drawing from that are extremely shaky. So we should remember things like the need for biological replicates. It's just the same as it ever was. Um, and then the, the study design matters. Like, I think people forget about study design, again, just caught up in the excitement of doing RNA-seq, so they'll, um, they won't think carefully enough about what they're really comparing in terms of the biological question. So, yeah, sometimes biological replicates are sometimes assuming to obtain an expensive sequence, so is it sensible to get one biological replicate for each of these cases, do the analysis of the biological replicates, and then try to validate the PCR or 
sense? I mean, it makes sense on one level. I think that's an extreme example, though, like the one versus one. I think you might say, let's do at least three or ten or, but yeah. I mean, if you, it all depends on what you're planning to do, but yeah, if, if it's a fishing expedition and you're trying to generate hypotheses that you're going to test at, a, at another level, then yeah, maybe it's okay. But you have to interpret it in that context. I mean, you, you can do it, but I would just be cautious because given, without enough biological replicates, you're not, you don't have an idea about variability from sample to sample in those maybe you have five genes you're interested in. And so you might very early on make a conclusion that, oh, this gene's not interested. It was interesting. It wasn't differentially expressed between these two samples and move on. And that could be the, the most interesting um, biological effect happening in that gene that you've missed because you just looked at one sample, right? So, and the same thing could happen in the opposite. It could just be random fluctuation or noise that caused one of the genes in your, your list of interests to be much higher than the, in one sample versus the other. And you spend all this time in the lab doing qPCRs and chasing this gene down and making a story about it when if you'd looked at three samples or ten samples versus ten samples, you'd see that there's a lot of variability in that gene and actually averaging across a series of biological replicates that's not significant at all. So, yeah, you just have to think about it carefully. And that, that's the only point I'm trying to make from this lessons learned. Sure. I mean, there's like a hundred flavors of biological replicates, right? So, yeah, that could be a biological replicate. Each kind of biological replicate is different, and it has different caveats that you need to think about. But, I mean, <coughs> if that's the, the question you're asking, whether uh, mutations in this gene or mutations in this pathway uh, result in changes in expression that are important, you're certainly better off to look at uh, you know, 10 or 100 patients with mutations that you believe are acting in a similar way compared to looking at just one or two. But yeah, I would consider those biological replicates. Yes, I would say it's better. Uh, generally, what we're finding with RNA seq now with the maturity of the technology is that technical replicates are in, have insanely good correlation. Like, they're almost a waste of time at this point. Like, doing things like comparing the estimates you get from one lane versus another, or taking your sample, dividing it into two, isolating RNA, sequencing them independently. There's very little variability between those. I mean, it's not a bad, a horrible idea to do, but if I was going to spend my money, I would much rather spend it on biological replicates and even imperfect biological replicates rather than technical replicates. Like really all you're doing with a lot of those technical replicates is getting more depth of the same thing because the data is so consistent within the technical side. There's also about 10 different kinds of technical replicates though. So depending on what your experiment is, you might consider a technical replicate at various levels on the wet lab side as well, right? And those can have more sources of variability. Like you know, plates from the same colony but pulled from the incubator on different days or there's a kind of a gray zone between biological replicates and technical replicates, especially in in vitro experiments. But on the sequencing side, the, the data production side, technical replicates are tend to be ex extremely reproducible. So much so that they don't really have much point. Like when we do um, whole genome sequencing or RNA sequencing of a sample and we feel like we didn't get enough depth, we'll go back and just do another lane of that same library and just add it to the 
to the same BAM file, basically, as if it was just more of the same. We don't like look, stop and look and say, are these really the same? Because those experiments have been done to death, and it's fair, quite safe to combine those kind of technical replicates and treat them as just more data. OK, any more questions? Yeah, multiple testing correction. So has everyone heard of or familiar with multiple testing correction? Is anyone not familiar with it? No? So the basic concept of multiple testing correction is that um, when you do a statistic, when you compare a set of samples for one gene, there's a certain chance that you're going to see a significant difference between those two uh, sets of conditions um, by accident, just because of noise, right? There's variability in your data, you're, just like we've talked about. And when you compare you know, group A to group B, sometimes you'll see a gene that looks significantly differentially expressed that doesn't get borne out by uh, repeating the experiment, for example. But it had a significant p-value, right? There's just a certain risk of that happening. And maybe it's a small percentage. As you do more and more tests, the chance that some of your significant results are those kind of false positives increases. And basically, there's a certain fraction of your significant tests that are bound to be not real. That's a problem with multiple testing. The more you test, the more chances there are of finding something that's spurious, basically. And the danger of that is that when you do these genome-wide studies, you're looking at tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of features. And if you don't correct for the possibility that with this many tests, some of them are going to be fake results or spurious results, then you could spend, again, a lot of time chasing down phantom observations. So this has been a, a very well-established field since forever. Um, in the microarray days, you would always make sure to run some kind of multiple testing correction on your p-values. Yeah? No, I mean more at the level of the features. So if you have, let's say you have 10 tumors and 10 normals, and you're comparing those uh, replicates, each test is at the gene level. So I say gene A, look at the expression level across these 10 normals and these 10 tumors. If it's higher in the tumor than the normal, I'm, according to some statistic, that's a test. I'm going to do that again and again for every gene in the genome. That's the multiple tests I'm talking about. The problem with RNA-seq is that we've just taken that problem and compounded it by several orders of magnitude, right? Because you've now got not just 10,000 genes or transcripts, but you've got hundreds of thousands of exons hundreds of thousands or millions of possible junctions of uh, exon intron boundaries that you might be interested in, um, small RNAs. Um, there's just a huge variety of things you might possibly want to test for. And you can just keep doing more and more tests for all these things until you find all kinds of significant results. But unless you correct for that number of tests that you're doing, many, if not most of those, could be false positives. So RNA-seq field didn't need to do any work to um, develop these um, correction methods. They're already very well established. A very popular package is the bioconductor malt test package. So you can take your, um, your p-values from your many statistical tests you performed, and you can correct them for multiple testing with a package like this. I think that CuffDiff actually has this built into it. So when you run CuffDiff, you're actually going to get both raw p-values and corrected, they usually call them q-values, when the p-values have been corrected. So you want to be aware of that when you're interpreting your differential expression data. And then the downstream interpretation of expression analysis, there's a whole topic for uh, probably another course, but um, I think Malachi is going to go into some aspects of downstream analysis from the perspective of alternative splicing. Uh, but you can take the expression estimates from cufflinks, cuffdiff, or alternatives, and they could be fed into many different analysis pipelines. Um, we also provide a supplementary R tutorial 
if you want to practice your new R skills, that's a little bit more accessible than the Cummerbund stuff. So Cummerbund, they've basically added a lot of layers of abstraction to R uh, and create a lot of complex functions that allow you to very quickly just say, run this function and give me this pretty graph. Uh, but if you want to see more how to build that up yourself, like from scratch, using custom plotting methods and things like that, uh, we provide a supplementary R tutorial for that. And it goes into examples like how to make the typical clustering heat map you see in a lot of papers. Um, how to do classification analysis. I don't think that's covered, but that's another topic. Uh, things like pathway analysis, of course, your, your differential expression results from CuffDiff can be fed into these kind of packages or websites or software, uh, just like from any other kind of platform. So the tutorial, I guess, that we could start now or after a break. When is the first break schedule? There. Okay, so we have lots of time. Um, we're looking now at this part here, right? So we've done uh, our raw sequence data. We've run bow tie and top hat, so we now have our alignments. We're going to do transcript compilation now with cufflinks and expression estimation. We're going to use cuff merge uh, to merge together the different cufflinks assemblies from our different samples. And then we're going to do cuff diff to do some comparisons of samples. And finally, we'll use Cummerbund to visualize the results of those. Okay, so just a few slides to review what we're going to do in the exercises. So we're going to generate gene slash transcript expression estimates with cufflinks. We're going to perform a differential expression analysis using first cuff merge and then cuff diff, like was described. And then we're going to summarize and visualize those results with cummerbund. Uh, and then optionally, uh, you can play around with the old school R methods. So just to explain all the files that are available on the wiki, uh, you have this tutorial module 3 part 1 uh, which is the Linux commands that are going to run cufflinks and cuff merge and cuff diff and that's what we're going to go through next. When that's done um, we're going to use uh, this cummerbund R script I should say dot R I think to summarize and, vi and visualize the results of part 1 and then, kind of optionally, you have this part three, supplementary R and edge R analysis, which we probably won't have time for, but uh, you can take back. And if you want to do the HTC count edge R approach for differential expression, you have kind of an example of what that would look like. So to generate expression estimates, we're going to start from the alignment BAM files that we generated yesterday. And those are going to be used in cufflinks to calculate expression estimates. And we're going to do this for all transcripts on the target chromosome of 22. Uh, there's an option in this step uh, called dash G, uh, which forces cufflinks to calculate expression values for known transcripts. Um, to discover novel transcripts with cufflinks, we would not use the G option. I think this is actually now covered in Malachi's next module, which should have been pulled out of this lecture. Uh, but basically, this step of generating expression estimates with cufflinks is going to give us FPKM values uh, where each fragment corresponds to a read pair in the genome. So uh, there's going to be some optional commands to use uh, additional alignment files. So we did both cuff, uh, sorry, top hat and star alignments yesterday. So a lot of basically everything we're going to do today could be done with either the top hat alignments or the star alignments, and it should work more or less exactly the same. I think in the tutorial, we're just going to go through with the top hat stuff. But if you wanted to 
satisfy yourself that it works just as well with the star alignments, you could run the commands with the star alignments. The other alternative that we're going to explore today is this count base method. So we're going to use HTC count. Um, remember this requires a slightly different sorted SAM file. I don't remember if we did that yesterday if we're, or if we're going to do that today. And in the end, if you do all of the different options, you would have uh, estimates from top hat alignments and cufflinks, or star alignments and cufflinks, or top hat alignments and HTC count. And you could also do star alignments and HTC count if you wanted. This is one of the challenges when you start doing alternate methods, that you have like so many paths you can go down. Once we have the cufflinks results, we're going to use cuff merge and cuff diff. Um, that's going to combine the expression estimates from our four libraries into more convenient files. Uh, and it's going to combine expression estimates across replicates. And then we're going to compare the tumor versus normal samples and identify significantly differentially expressed genes and transcripts. So these commands can get complicated when you have replicates. So just, um, you know, we have to be careful how we set up the commands. They've been set up for you. But when you're doing this on your own, uh, the ordering and positioning of the samples that you give to the cuffdiff command really matters because that's how the statistical tests are going to be defined. Uh, we pretty much talked about this already. Once we have the cuffdiff results, we're going to visualize them in Cummerbund. And we're hopefully going to see nice uh, figures like this. And then we're going to do some post-processing of files, which is necessary if we want to do um, the old school R analysis. So the output of cuffdiff is perfectly designed to go into Cummerbund because it's part of the same software package. But if you want to do other analysis, just your own custom analysis in R, you kind of have to uh, munge the files a little bit into a format that's um, more useful for, for that purpose. Uh, yeah, so this is the, op the optional supplementary R scripts. Uh, it does things like examine expression estimates, look at how reproducible the technical replicates are, and how the different library methods correlate. Um, if you go through those exercises, you can answer some of these kinds of questions. And if you do all of the optional things, you can also compare the differential expression results from the cufflinks analysis to the HTC count analysis. And you'll see that there's an overlap and a substantial non-overlap between the significantly differentially expressed genes from the two methods. 